Welcome to Taking the Lead with Astrological Magic. Thank you for coming. I will be taking questions at the end, so go ahead and log any that occur to you, not in the chat, please, but somewhere else. If they don't get answered throughout the course of the presentation, I'm going to try to answer as many as I can when the time comes, and I will be coming back after we cut off the recording, so there will be extra time. Astrology can sometimes feel like a one-way exchange, us looking to the sky to discover what it has to say about our inner worlds and manifest realities. But how can we introduce more agency and influence over how things unfold in order to build a life and cultivate a character more in alignment with our choosing? Learn how practical applications of planetary magic shift us from passive interpreters to active participants in the dance between fate and free will. Because this is an astrology conference with a high number of professional attendees, we're going to venture more deeply into the technical rabbit hole than I otherwise venture, but I promise that by the end, you'll be armed with actionable ways to get started. Let it also be said that what I'm going to share is informed by my own experience and background and my personal syncretic, if it gets results, then use it approach. Obviously, I don't speak for everyone and valid opinions differ even amongst professionals in their field. So let's dive in. Hi, I'm Caitlin Kopic. Some of you may know me as Austin's wife, others may know me as the proprietress of Sir and Sundry, and some might not know me at all. 13 years ago, Austin and I started seeing each other and he informed me on our first date that magic was real. The Picatrix, which is basically the de facto Bible of astrological magic, was translated into English and commercially published for the first time. And that is when we began working with it in 07. What you see here is one of my earliest talismans, a sprinkle jar capturing a Mercury Heavy Grand Air Trine, and it is still in dutiful operation to this day. In 2010, we moved to Los Angeles and opened an occult and Gnostic arts collective with our friends Ryan and Vanessa, where I poured our first talismanically elected candles in dedication to Saturn and Venus. I would show you photos, but that was a few laptops ago, so this blurry old logo it is. This is the first Algal Eye talisman I made in 2011. I spent the next eight years devoted to my continued magical and astrological development, but my professional focus was on web design. In 2018, I started Sphere and Sundry, born of Austin's electional prowess and my high priestessing. What you see here is the first Instagram post made from the Sphere and Sundry account. Here's an evolution of the Algal Eye Talismans created for the first Algal series we released to the public. A dedicated choice was made to start the business offering a regular series. The star is known for leadership and visibility, so it tends to be a go-to in career pursuits anyway, but especially in my pace because it is conjunct the midheaven of my natal chart. So that is our first lived example of how astrological magic can be used in a practical way to get a leg up. This is the working altar for Venus and Libra. The first Venus and Taurus series was actually created in a hotel room at Norwalk last year. And finally, we have the Soul and Leo working to give an example of my more recent work. So what is astrology? There are a lot of different types of astrology, but in practice, it typically involves consulting the position of celestial bodies to see how they influence or reflect internal and external manifestations. This can be done retroactively in the present or to forelight the future. Magic too involves different approaches, but in practice, it typically comes down to the rallying of external and internal forces to alter conditions in accord with one's will or desire. It's turning to the powers that be who hold sway over manifest reality in a hopefully successful act of co-creation. Together, they are astrological magic, where the forces we're mobilizing are most often planetary and stellar. There are a number of advantages to the astrological mode of magic, one which practicing astrologers are already familiar with, which is that the movements of celestial bodies organically hold a tremendous amount of sway over the unfolding of manifest reality. It's a branch of natural magic, where we're working with and drawing from the mechanics already influencing our experience of the world, ourselves and each other. In some ways, it's extraordinarily easy to create big, impressive results using this method, but that also makes it dangerous, especially when we're talking talismans and talismanic materia, which is designed to hold and perpetuate a charge over the long term, because... This practice is based on elections, which are very precise moments in space and time encapsulated by a single chart. In talismanic operations, we're typically working in 45 minute increments or less. What you see on this slide is the chart for a series I'm hopefully releasing this week, 
COVID delays called the Luminous Crown, where the window of consequential operation was 12 minutes from 6.49 to 7.01 a.m. That tiny window of time was necessary to stay within the overlapping confines of Aries rising and the hour of the sun. If you don't know what that means, we'll cover planetary hours in a little bit. Apologies to everyone who is very familiar with that. Um, full disclosure, this chart is a little bit different than most in terms of it being a hybridized election. The working and opening address were designed to capture the sun and moon simultaneously in their signs of exaltation, the moon supported by Venus in her rulership, Saturn in its rulership, and Mars in its single degree of exaltation. That's five strong dignified luminaries and planets together, making for a very rare and eminent configuration. Note that most elections are based on a single power supported and unafflicted by other chart factors, such as a talisman for Jupiter or for Regulus. Either way, the entire chart has to be considered because if the body that you're giving all the power to is under siege in some meaningful way, that's going to manifest in your results. That doesn't mean every placement in the election holds a lot of power. It means that other bodies need to be out of the way from afflicting the star or planet of the show. There are rules to abide by an astrological magic that are different from other forms of astrology, most of which are detailed in the peak tricks. Which brings us to our first public service announcement. The number one way to hurt yourself with talismanic astrologically based magic is to botch the election. That's where the most meaningful power is coming from. It's the chassis and the engine of how the magic is going to manifest and the birth chart of any item that is created under its banner, especially if it involved a ritual process. We can think of this in terms of people being living, breathing talismans of their natal charts, where factors compete toward different ends and the overall arcs of life are determined by which powers hold the most influence and how beat up or blessed they are at various times. As astrological magic is getting more popular, there's an increase in people incorporating astrological timing into the creation of what they sell. If you are in the market, I would encourage you to educate yourself and vet these elections to the best of your ability and not take anyone's word for it that something was created on an auspicious election or with the right astrological timing in ad copy. What you're buying is the chart, whether that be in the form of a talisman or a perfume or an incense. Someone could very well believe that they are using the right timing, but not have the experience or knowledge to do so. So ultimately the responsibility falls to the consumer to protect themselves and producers to become reliable masters of the arts that they practice. Now that that is out of the way, the thing with astrological magic is that you have to have specialized knowledge of astrology and magic, and you have to get it when the getting is good. Great talismanic great elections are relatively rare. You have to wait until the power is ripe and the conditions are right to harvest the energies. Canning metaphors work really well for this. There's only a certain time in the year when grapes are at the peak of their ripeness, and that's when they should be picked. They can be made into wine and preserves and enjoyed for a long time that way, but the window to harvest is very slim. Here we have Buffy giving a past prime avocado the side eye. I think we all know that feeling. Petitions are a different story. A star, I'm sorry, a petition is when you pray and make offerings to a planet or a star, asking for something that is within its power to give you. Make sure that you're turning to the right power for what you want. You don't go to a pizzeria, order a burrito, and expect them or you to be happy about it. The conditions for a petition are much easier to meet. For planets, use the planetary day and hour, especially when the planet is dignified by sign and not completely busted. You can still ask for things when a planet is under duress, but the results are not going to be as quick or desirable. For stars, petitions should be made when the moon is within two degrees of the star, preferably on the applying side, and conjunct the ascendant or the midheaven. You can also do it when the rising or the MC is tightly conjunct the star without the moon, but Luna being there once a month is going to make the results easier to manifest. Um, this is typically what people are getting their feet wet with. Apologies in advance to those familiar with these concepts. Um, the planetary days are as follows. A lot of them give themselves away as easy mnemonic devices. Sunday is the sun's day, Monday is the moon's day, etc. Planetary hours are not comprised of 60 minute intervals, but a division of time between sunrise and sunset into 12 equal parts, each governed by one of the seven classical planets and luminaries. The easiest way to find the planetary hours to use an app or an online calculator, many of which are freely available, 
in this table, you can see how the first hour of each day following the sun's rise is governed by the same planet as the day itself. And then they proceed in Chaldean order. There's also the concept of planetary nights, where the first hour following sunset is the general ruler of the night's occupation. Planetary days and hours are important because they're the easiest way of keying any mundane or ritual activity to a particular sphere, which will bring more of the right kind of power to them. Download an app and you are all set. Returning to talismanic astrological magic for a moment, which is the preservation of planetary and stellar powers for continued use. The standard practice focuses on the creation of talismans, most often made of stone and metal, but my specialty is applying the same rigorous electional standard and Picatrixian protocol to empower other material forms, which I personally refer to as talismanic materia. This is the family portrait of the second Asclepius series. Asclepius is the Greco-Roman god of medicine associated with the constellation of the serpent bearer, which today we call Ophiuchus, and the fixed star Rossell Hogg. For more on the connection between astrological magic and healing, I'll have an article in Wellbeing Astrology Guide 2020 on the subject curated by the lovely, talented, and brilliant Kelly Surtees. And you can learn more in the meantime from the Sphere and Sundry site. I'm showing this photo to illustrate the wide variety of items that can be made in accord with a star or a planet's power. In addition to talismans, we have oils, hydrosols, incenses, face masks, bath salts, candles, you name it. They are all capable of being imbued with the electional power of their creation and offer more diverse utility than talismans alone. It's very hard for a pendant to provide an aura washing, for instance but a spray can do that beautifully because it's, it's, a, it's a power given to water and alcohol by their inherent nature. The chosen vessel and ingredients bring their own efficacy and utility to the table, greatly expanding the potential applications of astrological magic, which include practical magic and superpowered ingredients for magical practice, even utilizing other approaches to magic, such as using an Aldebaran incense for the activation of sigils to help create better conditions for material manifestation and command, or adding Jupiter and Sagittarius powder to a mojo, even though Jupiter is in Capricorn now, or dressing a reconciliation candle with Venus and Libra, etc. And now two roads diverge. How do you choose what astrological magic would be best for you? On the left, we have a chart or transit-based approach. Note that there is a log in the way because it is the more difficult path requiring specialized knowledge of astrology and remediation. On the right, we find the desire or need-based approach. Let's explore the more difficult one first, make scrambled eggs of our brains and then circle back to the easy stuff. You've probably noticed, but astrological, uh, astrological magic requires a classical framework. Dignity and debility have a lot of sway here, so pay attention to the planets in their rulership, their exaltation, their detriment, and their fall. Based on the natal, there are a number of things that can be augmented. We'll be using Julia Child's AA Rod and Raiden chart as a brief example. Remediation is a hot topic right now, so let's start by mitigating the bad. She has Venus in its fall in Virgo, which rules the sect light in Libra. So the Venusian sphere can get earmarked as a pain point worth doing something about. We'll want to support the key players in Julia's chart, which include Mercury as the ruler of the ascendant, which happens to be in its own sign of rulership and exaltation. So it has a lot of power, but it is retrograde. Magical support can help straighten that out, making it even better. The moon is her sect light, which is already being aided by work on Venus and Mercury. Mercury rules good houses, comes back to itself, and holds the most sway over other planets in the dispositor chain. So that's many points in favor of leading with Mercury. Now let's check in on our VIPs, our very important planets. Jupiter is in a strong position to help, angular and in rulership, so we'll rope his support in too. That won't cause any problems. Benefics tend to only make things better, especially when they are placed in and rule good houses. Saturn, on the other hand, is in a key gatekeeping position on the ascendant and ruling the midheaven. Malefics are harder to juice without causing problems, so let's not touch that until we get super good at what we're doing. Time will fix that by itself, as Julia's success came later in life. So that represents one of those karmic knots that can be difficult to override with acts of will and active intervention. 
fate takes the lead on that one. Our final prescription to get the most out of this chart is to focus on boosting Mercury as the prime power. We would want to have her wear a Mercury gem, probably at all times, get her a good talisman with secondary support from Jupiter and remediating Venus, both of which by extension help the moon. The moon is also in a complicated position, conjunct K2 and with very little light. So shadow interventions on behalf of the rulers are actually the safest approach to dealing with that without getting tremendously specialized. If Julia were open to planetary ritual, we would probably advise weekly devotions and offerings on Wednesdays and Thursdays to build really good rapport with her key VIPs and encourage the use of Mercury, Jupiter, and Venus materia in the days and hours based on the activity she was engaging. Note that the difficult thing about using charts of the eminent, as an example, is that Julia Child was wildly successful without magical intervention. But you can see how well-placed and capable the good stuff already is and where that leads. Most of us need a lot more help to get a fraction as far, but that is literally why we're here. Now, when it comes to what remedies and interventions to apply when, we add the layer of timing techniques. I can't get too deep into any one element because this presentation touches on a lot, but playing to your yearly perfection and active time lords can help empower your results. For those wanting to explore these terms and concepts more deeply, see the work on Hellenistic astrology by Demetra George and Chris Brennan, who else? Transits can also be filtered through the lens of other timing techniques to see which ones are going to be the most impactful and therefore ripe for magical intervention. The outcome of transits can be managed through various remedial strategies, some of them involving the use of direct astrological magic, others being donation or charity based, and yet others being alterations to mundane behavior. For instance, abstaining from sugar during the period of Venus is retrograde, which provides a channel or a rain gutter for those weird energies to run through, which minimizes um, potentially other more negative manifestations in the life that you didn't prepare for. It's similar to the custom of temporarily recasting the king when things were for when bad things were foretold for the leader of a kingdom. You can architect fail-safe or dummy targets for things that you know can't be changed and are going to manifest somehow, but that you want to have a little bit more control over. If your brain feels like this, you are not alone. Remediation is its own very deep rabbit hole, which is why I encourage people just getting started to take the need and desire based path instead, which we're about to cover. For more on remediation and personal chart-based strategies, I recommend that you get a prescription from a qualified expert. My leads for that are Austin Kopic and Freedom Cole, but there are absolutely others. If you want to offer this service to clients, please learn formally from a trained remedial specialist first. If you are going to play with remediation, start with yourself and use consenting um, friends and family when you're ready for guinea pigs and make sure that the results are as intended and desirable before moving on to practicing on third parties because we don't really wanna practice on third parties. We wanna know what we're doing. Another PSA, powerful magic and interventions can cause significant fallout. So there's a lot of cost benefit analysis that needs to be done. If you're venturing alone into this realm uh, of remediation and astrological magic with the natal chart, the safest bodies to experiment with are typically Jupiter, Venus, and the sun. Avoid malefics and planets conjunct Rahu. As astrologers, we understand that every chart is a snowflake. These guidelines will not account for everything that you're going to run into. It's just kind of a good start. And now the roads meet again and our path becomes less log littered because at the end of the day, the life and the chart reflect one another. If someone is honest with themselves and honest with you about what their biggest struggles are, it's easy to identify the most problematic spheres because they will present easily diagnosable symptoms. The sun issues with being seen and credited for your work, insecurity, issues with confidence, congruence and vitality. They may also struggle with leadership, have bad experience with leaders and not like being in positions where they are supposed to lead others or where people are looking to them for guidance. Uh, with the moon, emotional instability, lack of physical security, running on empty, habitual loss of gains, Mercury, difficulty communicating, getting from point A to point B, lack of mental focus and traction. We have Venus, 
um, a dearth of joy in the life, difficulty taking pleasure and connecting with people, disharmonious relationships, and a lack of taste. Um, taste is obviously subjective, but if people don't even kind of care or have their own sense of what they enjoy, that can be a Venus um, thing. Mars, issues with aggression, quarrelsome, a lot of burn bridges and cut ties in their life, strong in the asshole victim axis. So, um, you know, they probably, there are kind of two ways that that can go. Often like they're the asshole and they get cast that way in a lot of other people's experiences, or they're the perpetual victim because they don't stand up for themselves. Um, and Saturn issues with structure, authority and discipline, miscalibrated boundaries, depression, bad luck sickness as well. Jupiter lacking in wisdom, optimism, a sense of adventure, a broader context for things, a sense of the spiritual, also bad experiences with mentors and teachers or difficult relationships with figures like that. And at the end of the day, remember that the practice, remember that practical magic is working with what you have um, to get what you need. While astrological magic has an astrological basis, it is also magic. Neither is confined by the rules of the other alone, and by learning more about both, we start to figure out which strings to pull hard on and which ones we're better off leaving be. The confines of the natal chart are a whole different ballgame than what the entire sky has to offer in terms of magic. Aim to achieve your objectives, follow your dreams, and to get your needs met. Backed by mundane action and dedication, you'll be shocked at how much can change and how quickly. We both have more and less agency than we tend to think. People who come from an astrological background have this instinct where they want to lead with the chart and to stay within the bounds of, of the chart, whereas some magical practitioners don't like to think that their will can be hampered by anything other than themselves. The truth, of course, is that both things are true to greater and lesser degrees at different times and with different nativities, but that doesn't stop us from pursuing what will make us happy. So now let's practice thinking more like magicians and a little bit less like astrologers and consider the possibilities. Caracas are universal indicators for certain topics. Um, while Venus might not be connected to your seventh house of partnerships in the natal chart, Venus herself is always an indicator for matters of love. Whether you are using magic for yourself or for others, Venus should be considered as a member of your love-finding task force. Uh, so the sun, uh, personal success, achievement, fame, reputation, selfhood, leadership, congruence, and legacy. Um, and then I don't... this. This presentation is mostly focused on planets, but I will throw out some fixed stars that I'm very familiar with. Regulus is also a fallback um, for matters of the sun. The moon, home, family, food, cravings, fertility, manifestation, especially in its full or waxing phase, and then dissolution, um, which is the new or waning phase. Mercury, articulation, communication, transitions, commerce, focus, mental speed, the, the um, non-binary or binary, kind of both. Um, Mercury is the original hermaphrodite, but it's also very dualistic. Um, Venus, love, good relations, glamour, appeal, fun, joy, beauty, enjoyment, pleasure, feminine expression, Mars, physical activity, success in warfare, and in arguments, offense, defense, masculine expression, Saturn, discipline, maturity, boundaries, mastery, qualifications, patience, hard work, dedication, Jupiter, optimism, joviality, generosity, opulence, wealth, wisdom, teaching, mentors, and of course, he is very prolific. This is an exercise that you can do after the presentation if you feel called. Um, you'll want to get out a full-size blank sheet of paper and a pen, create a space with four columns. The widest one needs to be on the left. We're going to make something that ultimately looks kind of like this, but personalized to your own needs, desires, and potentially defects and points of self-improvement. The non-astrologer's simplest way is to omit the two middle columns um, but if you want to incorporate your natal, you can, and this can get pretty intense. You can list a lot of things. So the first question is, what do you need? 
I want you to think for a moment about if you have any needs that aren't being met right now. These are really weird times. I'm sure a lot of us could use more money or have recently found ourselves out of a job or are in need of more secure housing. Write those things down, one item per line. And now you wanna think about what you really want. Um, you wanna lean into that. Don't judge yourself for what you think you might want. Just write down whatever occurs to you. Don't write down what you don't want. Write down what you do. Uh, you don't have to show this to anyone or answer for it. And you can always cross things out later. Maybe you're ambitious and wanna be well known for what you do. Maybe a committed romantic partner would make you really happy. Maybe you wanna be rich. Perhaps you want to be more glamorous or photogenic or have a particular book on your shelf. Write down at least 25 things, more if you can muster it. Big and small, long-term and short-term. Desire is a vital magical engine and this exercise is designed to rev it. You can add noble things like live in a more just society or make positive political change, but start with the personal petty or material stuff because starting with issues of moral and ethical import tends to restrict the exercise. Um, and then are there any shortcomings or character defects that you wanna work on? Um, this goes back to the earlier list of symptomatics of uh, symptoms of problematic spheres. So if you wanna add any points regarding self-improvement, you can add those too. Here's the list of associated karakas for when it comes time to add them. Um, and then advanced. Uh, these are those two columns that are optional. So these are the houses. Um, go through each item in your list and write down which houses and angles they relate to in your chart. I'm not going to, um, let's see. Actually, I'm running ahead of time, so I will re read this. Um, the first house is also where the ascendant is. That is matters related to your body, physical presence, charisma and glamor, personal perspective. The second house, uh, assets, material possessions, and cash money at your disposal. The third house, day-to-day -day activities, local networks, places and people you regularly visit, routine ritual, and witchcraft. The fourth house, um, and then your IC may or may not be in your fourth house. Um, the nadir and midheaven axis can actually go between the third, fourth, and fifth if you're using certain house systems, which I use um, whole sign. So the fourth house is also going to have overlapping significations with your IC if that is in the third or the fifth. Uh, your home, your place of dwelling, family of origin, deepest secrets and motivations. The fifth, creative pursuits, generative projects, recreational sex, um, which you can still have that with a dedicated partner. That doesn't mean like, you know, just kind of dating based sex. That's just kind of where the, the fun is um, and joy. Sixth house, labors, health and financial habits, incremental physical gains and losses. Um, the seventh house, and that is where the descendant is as well, one-on-one -on -one partnerships, romantic and professional, and your relationship to the outer world. The eighth house, other people's resources that you have access to, investments, inheritance, partners' assets. Ninth house, higher learning, religious pursuits, books, philosophies, ceremonial magic, teachers, gurus. The tenth the midheaven also, achievements, reputation, career, um, how you're seen in the world. The 11th, networking, online reputation and interactions, hobbies turned into side hustles. And it's also the house of the good spirit. So you can also position, you know, angelic works there. The 12th, behind the scenes operations, occult matters. Uh, it's called the house of the bad spirit. So I guess we could sort of put more... Um, black magic type stuff there, um, dreams and hidden gnosis. Uh, you can also feel free to use your own understanding of astrology if there are any holes or contradictions there. It's kind of up to you. We're dealing with um, a broad spectrum of knowledge here. Uh, and then write down the ruler of the house and any planets inside of it in their associated columns. Again, by the end, you'll have something that looks like this. For simplicity's sake, I've blanked the middle columns. Feel free to cross out any item on your list that you decide isn't important or that you don't really want. 
So you can kind of review your list and go over if things are very important to you or if you just want to let that go for now. Um, and now you want to make a list of the planets somewhere to go with your table and add the designated amount of points for each item um, where the planet appears in your list. If you want to prioritize it, you can sort it into levels by how important that goal is. And um, Venus and Virgos is preferably with highlighters. For instance, the lines in green are the things that this person wants the most. So they're accounted for first and should also be highlighted to show that they have a higher rank. The yellow column is medium priority and should be tabulated second. You can have as many priority ranks as you want, just do them in order. And if you are going for the advanced version, then you also want to add the two middle columns into the process. Um, the ruler is given two points and planets residing in the house is given one point. And by the time that you finish with that list, you're going to have a pretty good idea of what what topics the planet that has the most points um, and most highlighter marks, that's the main one that you want to zone in on. The dead simplest version of this is to pick one thing that you really want and begin working with that planet, um, the one that is most associated with that thing, preferably a benefic or the sun. Um, and then to perform, create, or procure astrological magic um, with the planets with the most priority, especially if they're benefics and active by Time Lord and Perfection. Um, the most common way a lot of people get started is with weekly devotions. And that's uh, where you make, typically you pick the day and hour and you say a prayer. The Orphic hymns are um, great for that, but there's also planetary prayers in the Hygromantia. And uh, you can also write your own. Austin Coppock has a great piece on that um, in the Celestial Art. Um, and then you also want to make offerings. And the um, piece that I did for well-being last year, well-being astrology guide, um, has all of the planetary altar associations and good, good suggested offerings. I'm going to be putting that up on the website sometime soon. Um, and then planetary charity, which is, um, where you either donate your money or your time to benefit people who are in alignment with that sphere. So if you wanted to benefit the moon, you could donate to um, charities that benefit single mothers, for instance, um, or you could also, um, you know, volunteer at a soup kitchen and feed people. You can also get a mantra prescription and perform a sadhana. Uh, I recommend actually consulting someone who knows what they're doing to give you the best mantra for your chart because there are 1 million of them. And then um, you can also create or procure a high quality talisman or talismanic materia for the planet or planets that you wanna work on. And you want to apply and wear those before and during activities associated with your goals, even if it does not coincide with the planetary day and hour. Um, one thing that comes up often uh, when my clients start working with the stuff that they get from me is they say, do we have to wait and only use Venus stuff and Venus's hour? The answer is no. Um, if you get material that comes pre-enchanted and the magic's already been done for you, it's going to work whenever you use it, no matter what. Um, and, and when you want to key it to planetary days and hours is more when you're um, doing a different ritual operation. So let's say that you are um, casting a sigil shoal or something like that. If it is mostly about attracting the partner of your dreams and maybe getting laid, then yes, do that in Venus's hour and use Venus's stuff because it's going to boost the magic itself. But the wonderful thing about um, the world of this is that it is beautifully practical and you can just use things as needed. So um, I got to be honest here and say that 
I am super out of slides super early, probably because I rushed and I've never given a presentation like this before. And my Saturn Uranus in the third decan of Sagittarius um, was of course working on it up until the last minute. So we're gonna have a lot of time for questions. <laughs> Um, but the main takeaway is hopefully that astrology is not only something that gets done to and around us. It's something that we can capture, unleash, and perpetuate in our individual spheres according to our will, skill, and what would most benefit us. Um, actionable tips. The effective practice of astrological magic involves um, becoming good at astrological magic. So consult with reputable sources train in the style that appeals to you, whether that's syncretic, which is sort of Austin and I's approach, Renaissance, um, there are others, and with the teacher who appeals to you. There are a number of people um, working in astrological magic that are reputable. There's Austin, there's Christopher Warnock, there's Nina Griffin, um, Ryan Butler, the list goes on. You want to get yourself a copy of the Picatrix. The Warnock-Greer version is... Um, the one that I see people getting most often. Um, you can join online groups for astrological magic. There are some on Facebook. And then you just want to practice a lot. And for the passive use of astrological magic, that involves procuring from a reputable source. Make sure that the election is disclosed and vet the chart to the best of your ability. Use and wear what you get. It can't work if you don't use it. And talismanic material can be used as a component in other types of spell work that you may already um, practice and be familiar with. So when hoodoo, making mojos, dressing candles, that kind of thing. And then that just adds that extra planetary or stellar oomph to the magic that you're already creating. So it just potentiates everything. Um, so why don't from here, you guys think about what questions you want to ask, and I will tell a couple of anecdotes after I get my camera turned on and actual stories about um, examples of what can happen when you use astrological magic. Let me see if I can get my camera turned back on. And if, um, let's see here. I think everyone is still muted. I'm gonna pull up the chat. So um, one anecdote that Austin reminded me of uh, before we started this is the first time that he wore his Regulus talisman on a plane, he immediately got upgraded to first class for the first time. And that was pretty cool. And there are a lot of testimonials on the Sphere and Sundry site and in the Facebook group about other people's real world experiences using this stuff and the way that it sort of changes the dynamics around you and um, brings out the best in you that you wanna choose to support. Um, let's see, looking at questions. And if people want to ask questions out loud, they can also turn on their mic. We should probably keep most people, you know, unmuted. You'll need to but... Go in the other room to do that. I will. Oh, okay. Never yeah. mind then. Yep. Um, okay. Um, question Can you talk about the meaning of images and making them as it is said in the Picatrix? Are portions or oils images? That is an interesting question. So um, scholastic image magic or sim is what um, Clifford Hartley Lowe calls that form of practice. Um, and what I'm talking about is related to it, but it's probably a bigger umbrella. Um, image magic is the most common type of magic when it comes to what you inscribe in stones or metal. And then you can also use parchment or paper for that. And that's where you make um, an, an image appropriate to 
what it is you want to manifest. So let's, you know, stick with love because that's really common. Um, you might have a picture of a beautiful naked woman um, in the embrace of her, of her lover or something like that. And then you would want to find a good Venus selection um, and you'd want to inscribe that or draw it depending on what your medium is at the time. And then that would be um, a talismanic image. And then in terms of our potions or oils images, they are not. And that is where um, opinions start differing um, amongst some of the people that I know, because they there's an idea that oils and um, oils and waters cannot be talismanic because they can't have an image on it. And I would um, direct people to the work on, for instance, crystalline water structures um, by Mr. Dr. Emoto, I believe, uh, where the intention that you subject water to or the words or prayers actually changes the molecular structure of what you can observe. And so just because we cannot see and perceive like a, a big image doesn't mean that it's not changing the actual structure of what's inside. Sometimes we just don't have the capacity to understand what's happening, but they absolutely work. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they, they work. Um, do you consider a relocated chart specific to your location when working with astrological magic? I, I don't think that you need to bother with that. Um, the election will be for where it was made. And then I don't really think the relocation matters personally. Lisa asks, I'm curious about whether if you focus on a planet as a general signifier of something you want, do you find that it also automatically has effects in the houses where that planet is placed in and or ruling in your particular natal chart, even if not you are not particularly trying to affect those house topics? Yes, it does. Um, and that's part of why in the exercise with the spreadsheet um, for the people who wanted to do the advanced version, they actually took into account what house the planet was in and what the ruler was. Um, because they, it will manifest that way often in your life. Um, Venus things are going to bring Venus things, but if your Venus is in the third, you might find um, your romantic partner down the street at the convenience store. Whereas if it's in your ninth, you might encounter that person at the college that you attend. So the, the ways that it actually comes into your life do differ based on where those planets are in your chart. Um, someone stands Venus and Taurus. Thank you. Um, oh, and then I also meant to touch on this earlier. Some of the other fixed stars, um, that I've worked with quite a bit. Deneb El Getty is great for, um, boundary protection. It's sort of a star form that's really similar to Saturn. And um, it's really good for evil eye aversion and also for wealth generation, especially digital wealth generation, which matters more and more in our modern world. And then Aldebaran is another star that is sort of um, really good for money and manifesting material things. When a ruler is in its own sign and is a house, Okay, sorry. When a ruler is in its own sign and is in a house that is annually perfected and it is malefic, how would you use that to your advantage? Um, I would probably stay away from that as an entry level thing. Um, does talismanic material wear off? Yes, it does. That's a great question. Um, if I had known I was going to blow through my slides so quickly, I would have added slides for the different mediums and what they um, tend to do. So waters wear off the quicklet the the most quickly. Um, it's kind of like when you take a shower, you get wet instantly, and then you also it doesn't take you that long to dry off. Um, so waters have the most instant emotionally attuning 
sort of capacity and they change your state really quickly, but they also wear off really quickly. Um, oils are more medium term. They take a little bit longer to kick in, but they have more sustain. So a lot of my clients and myself will um, put water and oil on at the same time. If they have, like for instance, if they're about to go on stage, they might use regulus oil and regulus water. And then um, it sort of puts them in the right state right away, but then they can get through the entire presentation and then um, answering the questions at the end and everything else. And you'll sort of get a four to six hour duration from those seems to be the average. Um, candles have sort of a radiant effect. You can burn them in the room um, when you are doing an activity that you want their support in. And then you can also use them in candle magic where some people will carve petitions or sigils and then let them burn all the way where you're devoting the entire charge of the candle to a specific, you know, objective. Um, and let's see, are there any other forms that I'm missing? Um, incenses and, um, oh, okay, well, so in terms of that question, also that's sort of the immediate um, impact that they can have when you wear them on your person in terms of how long it takes for them to sort of go bad or lose their charge over time. If you're just, if you have them and you're storing them, that seems to vary a lot. Um, I have some stuff that has been good for years and is really powerful. I have other things that seem like they just sort of turned off. And some of that I have um, associated with uh, like bad transits to my own chart. So uh, I know that there have been a couple clients who had Venus oils and in isolated cases, they went rancid and it was because they were experiencing a really intense Venus transit in their own natal charts. And the materia seemed to absorb that. And so sometimes um, the breakable materia will sort of sub itself in and, and sacrifice itself or suicide bomb itself, either physically where the glass will break or where its charge will just dissipate. And, um, it, it sort of, you used all the energy that it was capable of providing. Um, so these things sort of have, um, a mind of their own and it's all this sort of complicated tapestry, I would say, involving magic and your natal astrology and the astrology of the world around you. Um, I know that uh, Kelly used soul in Leo oil before her keynote presentation the other day and the bottle broke. And that made a lot of sense to me because it probably donated its it, the, the entirety of the charge that sort of the battery that was the oil contained. It was like, okay, you're going to have a great presentation, but that's all I've got for you. So um, things manifest in tricky ways like that as well. Um, Austin also adds that he got told he looked like a celebrity by the taxi cab driver who drove him to the airport. Um, and he had had zero sleep the night before, so he definitely didn't feel that way. Um, and that was, that was right before he got the upgrade to first class. Someone says, if it is after sunset and there's a planetary night ruler, does the planetary day ruler still count for the full 24 hours or only during the day? That is a good question. And that's a little bit of a judgment call. Um, in my group, when this question has come up, I have talked about it in terms of, um, you can look at it either way and treat it in the way that gives you the biggest support for the power that you're working with. Um, so you can kind of make a case for either way. And those kind of concessions have to end up getting made in astrological magic because there is no such thing as a perfect election. Um, you know, you need to get the planet or the, the, you know, the power on an angle, preferably the first house um, the, on the rising or the midheaven. And you also need to have the moon there in the case of stars and a whole bunch of other things need to come together. And that's not always going to be, if, if you're working with Mars, for instance, that's not always going to be on a Tuesday. Um, but maybe it'll happen on the night of Mars. And so we can sort of add a little, um, a little shadow plus point if we can get it in the night of Mars instead then. Um, so you can kind of treat it either way. Um, 
how do you like to approach talismans for debilitated planets in one's natal chart? Uh, Joshua Proto. I know that that is a tricky issue and opinions tend to differ. Um, I think it really depends on the person. My go-to for any question like that is divine on it. Um, because also each talisman has its own election. So maybe this talisman wouldn't be good, but this talisman would be good because maybe um, if you're doing a Jupiter talisman, uh, well, that's not a good example. Um, but maybe the ruler of whatever the planet is, is in a good place in your chart or, you know, it, it, it's really negotiable. So I would say that you'd have to take that on a case by case basis. I'm not one of those people who thinks you absolutely cannot. Um, but I will say that if you have a bad planet in your chart, I really like working with, um, talismanic materia for that planet before deep diving into a talisman because it gives you a sense of, um, it kind of lets you work out the kinks before you're committing to a talisman. Um, because those experiences are briefer and they cause less ripples throughout the life. So a talisman is a really big sort of investment. I've likened it to, um, getting an organ transplant or like, um, you know, getting, you know, you're sort of installing something else within the body of your life if it's permanent. And so sometimes the body reacts, um, you know, in, in that similar case to getting an organ transfer, sometimes it rejects it. And so that um, suggestion not to get a talisman for a planet that is bad in your chart comes from that. But I think that that's kind of from getting thrown in the deep end too early and um, just not having a sense of how to work with those energies because sometimes things take adjusting to and you have to establish a new rapport. Um, for instance, so I have a Libra sun and working with Regulus was a revelation to me because I had no idea how to sun. <laughs> so it was really medicinal and it's the only reason that I'm willing at all to do things like this. It's still not my favorite thing, but before you would have never, ever convinced me, uh, to do anything like this. And now I can artificially use a power that I don't have to, you know, take myself out on this ledge. Um, Venus, I have Venus and Virgo as well. And Venus materia has been really profound for me. I remember the, the Venus and Libra series after I created that, um, I, I remember telling Austin, I just, I never, I don't feel like I've ever experienced joy before. <laughs> like, and of course I had, but in my weird Venus and Virgo way, I was like, oh, I get it. Like, I just want to have a glass of wine and fuck off. I went and I got a popsicle. Like I finished the working and typically I'm really anal about cleaning up the whole thing. And just like immediately I can't decompress until I put everything away and I completely conclude it and put everything in its perfect little rightful place. And I just didn't care. I was just like, I just feel like enjoying myself. I've worked hard. I'm going to just, you know, do what I want. And so it allows you to sample, um, sample vibes that you just don't have any familiarity with because it's not how you're wired. And so I highly recommend trying out, um, talismanic materia or creating your own or petitions or paper talismans to sort of test drive the types of energy that you like best, because there are also a lot of um, variations in these different expressions. So if we take Venus dignified by sign, we have three primary expressions of that. We have Libra and Taurus and Pisces. Which one are you going to like the best? I happen to like Venus and Libra the best, probably because I am a Libra. Then Pisces, because I have moon in Pisces, Venus and Taurus last because I don't have anything in Taurus. So it's just not something that I enjoy. So, um, I would just say that if you're looking at exploring talismans, just do your homework and, and try the energy first and see what you like and what works well for you. Um, what time does my talk end? Now that my PowerPoint stopped, I don't have my little 345. 3.45. Okay. Sorry, I ended so early, you guys. Um, 
how to use Jupiter talismans for travel that may happen later in the year. Bring it with you. <laughs> I mean, the beautiful thing about this type of magic is that just having it on your person um, is going to sort of make those things happen for you. Um, can you talk a bit about why to avoid planets conjunct Rahu? Thank you for asking that question, um, Mickey. I am a nodal truther. Um, <laughs> some people who have been following me for a while will know that. Um, the nodes are eclipse points and eclipses are horrible events. <laughs> like if you kind of go back to celestial omen divination, Babylonian times, think about how terrifying an eclipse would be if you're just in the field and the sky like goes goes dark and all the light curdles around you it's a terrifying horrific experience and when eclipses are were visible in certain parts of the world that foretold for instance the falling of that country or empire or king that's sort of one of those examples of when they would sometimes you know create a fake king and and put him in charge you know when that when the eclipse happened so that you know the real king didn't die um i think america has sort of a um, perverted relationship to Rahu. It tends to think that just because Rahu is good for material gain, that Rahu is a benefic. Um, anyone who has been around rich people <laughs> knows that that's not true. Um, I grew up in a family that was pretty well off and they were some of the, you know, least uh, well-adjusted people that you could ever meet. Um, it's, it's bad for people. Rahu causes, um, it's, it's shadowy. It causes occlusion, just like the sun or the moon disappearing. So whatever planet you have conjunct Rahu, especially if it is the sun or the moon, because the luminaries are uniquely vulnerable to the nodes, um, that, that planet is going to have Rahu problems with excess, with lack of self-awareness, um, and with this propensity to go too far and get too intense about things. Typically planets on Rahu are more in need of remediation than they are needing to be boosted, even though Rahu will want to make us boost that planet. Um, I have, I'm just divulging all of my terrible um, natal placements. I have um, moon conjunct Rahu in my natal chart and my life changed so much when I started doing the right mantra to remediate that. Um, I can't even tell you how much more at ease I am and how much less anxiety I have and how, how my headspace is less cluttered. Uh, so I would, encourage people to remediate whatever's on Rahu, not um, feed into it personally. Um, can you expand on the 11th house side hustle thing? Yes, Arthur. Um, so oftentimes the midheaven is in the 11th if you're using um, whole sign houses and that is that can be part of it because that's what you're being seen doing in the world. Um, also, if anyone attended Austin's talk uh, on Friday, Houses from Houses, you'll know that the 11th is the second from the 10th. Um, so it is like money that you earn from your career. So I think that that has to do with, with how it became associated with side hustles. That also has to do with sort of networking um, and you know, that also has to do with side hustles because typically if you're starting, you know, whether it's like a little crafting business on Etsy or something like that, you often start selling to the people that are around you um, before something turns into a business, if it's going to. Um, some of that is conjecture, but that those are my opinions on it. Um, I would love to see the slide with the sheet of wants, needs, and shortcomings before we leave and get access to that slide. Yes, so this um, presentation, especially because I went way too quickly, uh, is sort of designed for you to be able to go through it again and, and follow that uh, if you actually want to work on the worksheet. Um, I think that they've been putting up all of the, it'll be up shortly. You can go in and download it and, and rewatch it. 
uh, and pause on those things. I'm also going to send in my PowerPoint after this, so hopefully there, you can download it. Um, Catherine Grubb says that uh, two to three hours is what they've observed from getting hydrosols. Um, what are the procedures you prefer for uh, suffumigation from Graham Snyder? Um, suffumigation is really easy. You just smoke stuff. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's just you, you light the incense and then you, if, if you're, if you're talking about the ritual creation of a talisman or talismanic materia, you um, just pass it through the smoke. And oftentimes you'll kind of pray, pray and state your intentions and things like that as you're doing it. Um, is there any consequence from disposal of the little bits at the bottom of the oil vial? Um, whenever I'm getting rid of organic magical detritus, let's say, um, I prefer to return it to nature. I don't really think it's good for the magic in your life for that to like rot away in a landfill, for instance. Uh, that being said, I'm also a big fan of keeping all of the um, herbal matter and things like that and the gems uh, that you find at the end of your bottles and using them um, to dress candles or putting them in mojos and sort of upcycling and using all of the magic. And then you can sort of make yourself a little, um, you know, little talisman keepsake. Uh, and they're great to keep on altars or put in your wallet or anything like that. So I would, um, in general, recommend to you know, reuse and upcycle those things. Um, if you have time, will you talk about your energetic hygiene and boundary practices? Um, I'm actually working on an, an article about that um, right now. I'm not a big fan of banishing a lot. It seems like that's kind of fallen out of favor um, in occult circles, but energetic hygiene and sort of cleaning energies is different than banishing. So I'm a big fan. I have my my other backgrounds are um, in, involves feng shui, uh, so I'm a big fan of using bells uh, to sort of prime and break the energy with the metal element and with just the vibration and the sound. So I like to loosen things up, um, and you can do this in rooms or you can do it, um, just sort of in your auric body, depending on what you want to clear, um, break things up first. And then, um, I like to take smoke baths and you can use, um, talismanic materia incense for this. Uh, but you can also use just frankincense and you want to just um, kind of suffumigate your room or your body. And then there are sort of a lot of different things that you can um, do from there. I have a little iron sickle type of device that I sort of run to like cut cords and things like that. Um, and then you can kind of seal things off with um, anointing with some some holy oil or a Jupiter oil or an Asclepius oil or what have you for your purposes. And that sort of helps conclude everything. I'm also a big believer in physically cleaning things, um, says Venus and Virgo, before energetically cleaning things. Uh, you sort of want to prime the, the vessel in and of itself before you get to the more subtle stuff. Is that a magic candle in the background? It is. There are two magical candles in the background. Um, let's see. Daily planetary petition ritual. What do you recommend? Um, I use the Orphic hymns. Um, there are others. Um, yeah, you, I mean, you could, you could make up your own. It kind of depends on what you're petitioning for because maybe you want to ask for something specific. I'm also a big believer in um, just giving offerings and expressing your gratitude to the planets and stars without asking them for anything sometimes. Um, you know, your relationship with all of the spirits that you work with and the powers that you work with, they're not dissimilar from all the human spirits we know. No one likes a fair weathered friend. You don't want someone who just shows up when they want something and doesn't really give a shit about you otherwise. So I'm big on just staying in sort of contact um, with the pow the key powers that I work with and making sure that, um, that, you know, there's an open dialogue and that they feel appreciated. Um, okay. 
If someone were to use fixed star talismans or materia, does it matter where that star lands in their natal chart? For instance, if someone wants to boost the solar but Regulus lands in the 12th, does that matter at all? Um, with fixed stars, I would, so number one, and hopefully this sort of came through um, in just the talk at large, you can use the magic of um, planets and stars, even if you don't have that planet strongly. So the example that I used was Regulus is on my midheaven, but Regulus is good for visibility and leadership and everything like that anyway. So even if it falls in your 12th, especially with stars, I would say more than planets because they're just, they're further out there. Um, they, I think are kind of more autonomous and just do their own, do their own thing. Um, if you don't have something key conjunct a star, that doesn't matter. If you use the stars, the stars power and you petition the star, it's still going to do what that star does. I see planets manifesting more within the confines of the chart than stars. Um, so I don't, yeah, that's, that's what I have to say about that. I don't know if that's actually an answer, but those are the thoughts. Um, okay. It looks like I'm out of those questions. So if anyone wants to, oh, Ray Crawford. He suffered. Um, Gray asks, what is your perspective on K2 in contrast to Rahu if you have a light or a planet conjoining K2? That's a good question. K2 is not as malefic in my experience and observation as Rahu is, which is part of why I used Rahu instead of just the nodes throughout the presentation. K2 tends to have a purifying and ascetic and almost spiritual effect on what it touches. Uh, so because of its lack of sort of material focus, it doesn't tend to cause as many problems. Um, it tends to spiritualize whatever it is in contact with. Um, as far as if it's on a planet, uh, as far as if it's on a light, um, that might constitute some form of Vedic curse, but Austin would have to, um, Austin would have to confirm or deny that. Um, but I would see a remedial specialist uh, for specific question like that. Are we, uh, uh, yeah, no. um, yeah pretty are much. we done? All these people um, yes, we can be done. Okay. So I'm going to stop everything. Okay.